thank you everyone for joining. Nice to see so many people here. Yeah, as already in a, said in an announcement last year, I asked around who wanted who would be interested in a more practical and well, more theoretical topics. And so I decided to start today with that. And today we'll be categorizing programming languages. Um, because it's always interesting to see like what are the trade-offs and what is what is really happening. Nice. Okay. So categorizing programming languages. So as a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in all of these languages I will talk about. And so I might make some mistakes, um, but I'm, th I'm fairly confident that most of it, what I show here is correct. Um, in general, like in computer science, programming, whatever, everything is a trade-off. Like there is usually no silver bullet and no solution is better in all points than another solution. Um, so it's always, yeah, it's a trade. Um, today I will talk about these languages. Um, you might know some of them, I think probably among the developer crew here, um, JavaScript and TypeScript are pretty well known. Um, Rust probably from some Hacker News article is pretty known. Java, C, C++ as well, Python too. Um, but we also have some more interesting languages here. So for example, um, Idris, um, we ha heard a talk about Idris last week from Tony. Elm, which is a functional uh, language for the front end. Prolog, which is a logic programming language, which is unlike any other programming language here on this board. Erlang, uh, which is for massive parallelism. Um, well, massive parallelism of processes. And Clojure, which is a Lisp implementation and runs on a JVM. Um, OCaml is a strict functional language. And Haskell um, is, as you might know, a lazy lang uh, functional language. So um, for most of these axes, it's the, the outliners, the outliers that are the interesting ones, because like these do something different than the mainstream. Um, and usually, at least at the moment, the mainstream is imperative languages, C-like imperative languages. Also, in general, syntax doesn't matter. So if you have a new language um, that which only different is uh, difference is the language the, the syntax. This language will not be interesting to look at because in general, like of course for the programmer it does make a difference in the day to day work, but from the concepts and the trade offs, like syntax is irrele irrelevant, and that's also CoffeeScript is one of the best examples here. Um, so CoffeeScript is basically dead right now because its only thing was better syntax for JavaScript, and that's not enough to sustain like a whole language. You need something more. So um, I already talked about paradigms, so this can be really quick. We have imperative. This means um, basically you structure your uh, program as a sequence of actions to do. So do this, do this, while, that, do something else. Um, this is the classic C heritage that most languages these days have. On the other side, we have functional, which is where you do, um, which is the, the core concepts is based on the lambda calculus, and you do computation by evaluating functions. And um, so you structure your programs differently. And usually, you don't have built in constructs for loops and for uh, assignments, often, not always. And uh, the variables are not actually variables, but constants. You can't mutate them. So that's what the functional corner here means. And then logic, this is pretty different. So logic is basically where you have a bunch of statements. And you can query over those statements. For example, you can query if the head of the list. So if you have a list that is defined as a sequence of, um, of statements, you can, for example, split that into head and tail by unification. Um, I can't explain logic programming in a short time. So just that has to be enough. It's also interesting because while those are pretty well known, so in imperative corner, we have C, C++, and Go. Idris and Haskell are strongly in a functional corner. There's only really one logic programming language, Prolog and, of course, Prolog Descendants. Because turns out performance of Prolog is widely imp unpredictable, and it's really hard to write code in Prolog for a general purpose program uh, problem. Prolog excels for some small domain-specific problems, but 
usually Prolog is not a language you use for day-to-day -day work. So for the rest of the languages I mentioned earlier, those are away from the logic corner of this triangle. Um, so they are only between imperative and functional. I've put um, JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, Python, and Rust a bit more to the functional side because, well, I could C++ should actually be there too, because they have built-in syntax for Lambda functions and some library-defined uh, 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 higher-order functions like map, reduce, and all that stuff. So that they are more to the functional side than just pure imperative stuff like C. And from the functional side, a bit more into the imperative side, I positioned OCaml enclosure because, for example, they let you do I.O. anywhere in your program. Um, OCaml, you uh, can just in any program, uh, in any part of your program, print to the console. Closure is the same. Idris and Haskell prevent that. So there's a bit like there's more about sequenced actions uh, in OCaml and Closure than in Idris and Haskell. But they are very much functional. So if you divide that triangle in the middle, like this half are imperative languages and this half are functional languages. Um, but of course, you can use TypeScript and JavaScript to program exclusively functional. And even in Haskell, you can program exclusively imperative. Um, this will not play to the strength of these languages, but you can do it. Also, in general, if you have any questions or remarks, please just interrupt me. I can't see the chat while I'm presenting. So yeah, just interrupt me. I won't need the whole hour, so we can discuss if there's need for discussion. A second exodus is really interesting because you usually don't talk about it, is strict versus lazy. Um, what does this mean? Is the question if this program would crash. Um, again, as I said, syntax doesn't matter. So I chose here TypeScript syntax or JavaScript syntax, because I guess most of you are familiar with it. But you could translate it to some equivalent version in any language here. The point is here, we have some, some value that will crash once it is evaluated. And you have a function that takes two arguments, but only uses the second. So the question is now, if I call this function with a crash and hello, will this program either crash or print out hello? Most of the languages are very much in the strict part. And it also doesn't matter if they're functional or uh, imperative. So you see Idris here, you see C here, OCaml. Um, so those all would crash with this program. And Haskell and Prolog are the, other, the only ones I know of that are lazy. But Prolog, you have to be a bit careful here, because Prolog does not really work like other programming languages. So take this with a grain of salt here. But Haskell, every statement in Haskell is lazy. So if we go back to that, um, this Y would never be, like this crash here, even though we call it, it's it's never evaluated, because it's not used. So that's what it means to be lazy. And in Haskell, every statement, every, every expression is lazy. Um, I've put TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, and Rust a bit more to the lazy side, because those have, as far as I, as I know, um, built-in syntax for generators. And generators are basically um, a construct on how to have lazy streams in a strict language. So it's not the only way you, of course, can make, like a function is always lazy because you only evaluate it when you call it. Um, but I talk about more, syntax, more language support beyond functions. <laughs> One comment, uh, isn't closure also like partial lazy, like the at least the data structures are lazy by default. Uh, I wasn't sure about that, uh, to be honest. So yeah, could could possibly be. Um, I just know that execution is uh, strict. So I was not sure about if the if the if the functions are strict. So I, I as far as I know, if you call a function in closer, the arguments are evaluated before you call the function. So that's also one of the big differences. So in strict languages. First, you evaluate the arguments, and then you evaluate the function. In la lazy languages, you first evaluate the, uh, the, the function, and only if you need the arguments, you evaluate them. So call by, call by value and call by need is often called. And so that's why I put closure here. But of course, um, yeah, probably, as I said, you can always fake laziness in data structures or with functions. So I'm not entirely sure. I haven't done that much closure, so I'm not an expert there. Um, another very important differentiation bet between uh, languages and one that is more useful for the average programmer than strict versus lazy is because there's more variety is compiled versus interpreted. What does this mean? Like in the end, 
the thing the CPU understands is machine code. So one way or another, your program has to somehow get translated into machine code. And the question is, when does it get translated? Um, so for compiled programs, you have some program that takes your source code and spits out machine code. This is a binary you can run, but this binary will depend on which CPU it is runs on. So for most desktop CPUs, it would be either x68 um, or x68-64, 86-64, sorry, uh, instruction set. So that was Intel and AMD processors. Um, for mobile devices, this is usually ARM. So depending on where you want to deploy to, you need to compile your source code multiple times. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have interpreted, where you have some program that is already compiled, so can be run on a CPU, that you hand out to your users. And this program will read your source code and then execute what it says. So again, ends of the spectrums are rather easy to spot. So on one end, we have uh, classic compiled languages. On the other hand, we have purely interpreted languages. Purely interpreted is not completely true because Python usually for performance uses uh, C modules and C modules are again compiled. So there is, it's never easy or black and white to differentiate. And also we have a lot of wiggle room in between. So we can, for example, technically Haskell is, uh, it, it is compiled. But technically, the Haskell source code is compiled to what's called STG, the spineless tagless G machine, which is some sort of bytecode that the Haskell runtime and the garbage collector work with to actually execute. So it's technically a VM, but not really. Idris 2 is also a bit special because Idris 2 will be translated to scheme. And Scheme is compiled to native code, so you have two compilation steps. So that they are still very much compiled, all those languages, just with some caveats. Then with a bit more distance, we have languages that are both compiled and interpreted. So Java and Clojure both run on the JVM, the Java virtual machine. So you first compile your code into Java bytecode, which is like an abstract or defined instruction set, like just like x86 or ARM. Uh, for real CPUs, but it's an abstract one that is, and so you need an abstract machine to actually run it. And this is then the Java virtual machine. Erlang is similar. Um, Erlang runs uh, on the Beam VM. So you compile your Erlang code to run it to object code that will then run on the Beam virtual machine um, to parallelize it. And a bit further, I have JavaScript because you don't compile JavaScript per se. Of course, if you use, you use features that require Babel, or something like that, you will have some transpilation. But in general, JavaScript is sent out in source. And then, as Python shows, pure interpretation is not fast enough for most use cases, even for just, just uh, showing it in the browser. Um, so what V8 and Gecko and all the other JavaScript engines do is interpret it at first, but then the, the parts of the code that are run very often uh, are compiled on the fly to native code and then used. So that's a JIT compilation, just-in-time compilation. TypeScript and Elm, I put a little more to the compiled side because you first use a compiler to compile TypeScript and Elm to, types, to JavaScript, and then you have V8, which then again does JIT compilation to native code. So. This is a really interesting spectrum for me because depending on what your requirements are, this depends what what you want here. For example, Python is really easy to get going. Just install the interpreter and you have basically a, a instantaneous uh, read and uh, a write evaluate loop. On the other hand, for bigger stuff, its performance is just not adequate enough. JavaScript, TypeScript are better in that regard. But for example, TypeScript, the compiler for bigger project, tends to be kind of slow because it's written again in JavaScript uh, or in TypeScript. It is not as fast as it could be. Also, the number of optimizations it can do is limited. You're basically trading on this axis. You're trading um, time for the developer versus time for the user. So Python is basically no time uh, used to translate for the developer, but every user has to uh, compile or translate the program again and again. 
And on the far side with, uh, inter with compiled languages, you have a one-time effort on the developer side to translate it to machine code. And then the user can just run the machine code. But again, this, of course, is a, is a time step that is re requires uh, the developer to have some automation or spend some time drinking coffee while he wait, he or she waits to do uh, to to translate their programs. So yeah, this is not only a speed trade-off, but also a development speed uh, or developer experience um, trade-off. So many compiled languages try to in improve that with a language server that uh, constantly keeps track of only the changes made. But um, it only goes so far. Access 4, this is also really interesting because the more general a language is, the less special syntax it can give or can reasonably give to special purpose uh, problems. So in one end, we have the pretty general languages. You can use those for pretty much anything. But of course, they do not have uh, any special architecture or syntax for domain-specific problems. A bit more in the specialized region, I've put um, Go, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Python. JavaScript and TypeScript mainly because JavaScript was designed as a scripting language for the browser. And while you can use JavaScript with Node on the server, it is not something I recommend because you see the, her the heritage. It's it's not, in my opinion, not a pleasant experience. Um, Go uh, puts itself specialized as basically uh, servers and servers only. And the language with the Go uh, routines and everything is, is specialized towards that. And Python is in general, is, is general, but its performance makes it simply inadequate for most pro uh, problems you have. So some ML scripts where you offload the performance to C, that's fine, but writing some uh, application in Python, probably not that reasonable. Um, I say here general, but general is always with a caveat, like there are no silver bullets. You can use Java for everything, but at some point you might hit performance limits with the garbage collection. So you might need to use object pooling or garbage pauses are a no-go. So you need to use something like C, C++, or Rust. Rust might be too complicated for new developers to hire. So you know, might have to use something else. So there's no, tr no true general programming language or solution. There's always at least some trade-offs here. On the more specialized side, then I, I've put Idris and Erlang. Idris, you can write, and Idris tries to be the most generally av applicable um, dependently typed language. So it's not only for proving stuff, but also for to write real programs. But it being a dependently typed language makes it really specialized to applications where, where security is important. Erlang was developed for telecommunications and it is focused on massive parallelization of processes. Um, the Erlang reason detra is basically fail fast and just restart. So it is you like you, you handle it is important that you, you can restart and uh, move your processes, your Erlang processes, but um, like that security is not that, uh, so type security is not that important. And Erlang therefore is pretty good if you have some decentralized or federated task to do. And on the far end of the spectrum, I've put Elm and Prolog. Prolog, because as a logic programming language, its use cases are pretty limited. And Elm is on the website itself. It says it's it's for UI, for front end browser UIs, and that's basically the only thing you can use it for. There's the Elm architecture, which is how you write your Elm programs, and it's focused on UI. So while people find Elm uh, really nice to work with for UI, you will have pretty much impossible to do anything else without going through huge pains and through JavaScript and, uh, in, in the, to actually get out of uh, the Elm architecture. In general, using a more general purpose programming language allows you to be more flexible about what you want to do. And if you know a general purpose language, you can apply that language to more problems. On the other hand, using a more specialized language will allow you to increase your productivity in that special area 
but it is not always transferable to other problems. For example, if I need to write a server, I will have a hard time with Elm. Same with Prolog. Um, if I want to write front-end code, Go is probably not my the best choice for that. So this is how one of the reasons why one would pick either a general or special purpose language. And then one of the more the, the most interesting topics aside from types is memory management. And this is again a triangle. So you have either you can manage memory at runtime, you can let the programmer handle memory management, or you can offload it to the compiler. So bef uh, at development time. This also means that this axis up and down means either you as a programmer have to do it manually or automatic. So down here, you don't need to uh, manage memory. It will be either done by the compiler or the runtime. And in that axis, it's either dynamic, so at runtime, or static at compile time. Um, what I mean with memory management in general is if you allocate new objects, how does this project work? And if you don't use the objects anymore, how will they leave the memory? In, in C and C++, you explicitly use malloc and free or new and delete to manually allocate data uh, as memory on the heap and give it back to the system. But actually, it's not completely in the programmer's hand because for data that is allocated on the stack, it is automatic. It will automatically be deallocated once it leaves the scope. Of your pro of the current scope, so for example, the end of the function, the end of the loop, whatever. Most of the languages, there were too many, so I didn't want to cram them all in one corner. Use garbage collection. Garbage collection is the one thing basically you do at runtime. So you have a language runtime, and every once in a while, the language checks which objects are actually still in use, and then deletes those that aren't. And Again, this is completely uh, indifferent if this is a functional or a even a logic programming language or an imperative programming language. Many languages use garbage collection. But there's one more interesting stuff, and that is Rust. You see, Rust is also on that side, so there is no runtime that would free memory. But it is also way more on the compiler side than on the C, C++ side. Because Rust's type system uh, with linear types and affine types, well, only affine types, um, allows the programmer to specify which data is shared and which not. And this prevents large classes where you would have to, uh, so the Rust compiler can track how long some data is alive and automatically insert a free call after the data is not live anymore. Um, but it's not completely automatic. So sometimes you need to annotate your functions with lifetime uh, annotations to say, OK, this data will live exactly as long as this other data. Um, sometimes it's not possible, so you need to do heap allocations, even if it's th in theory wouldn't be needed. Um, of course, you can um, go around this with unsafe, but, get, but again, unsafe allows to do anything manually. So Rust is not completely there yet, but there is very interesting research going into that direction. So to offload more of the memory or all of the memory management to the compiler, no matter what your program is, which is really, really interesting. Now to my favorite part about programming languages, and that's types. Before I go into the axis, I want to talk about a few misconceptions about types. Um, the first one, type languages force you to specify types everywhere. Um, the classic example for this is this Java program. Person person is equals new person, where the first and the last person is basically just redundant information. But this is rarely true anymore. So many languages, including Java, allow you to have local type inference. So type inference basically means the compiler figures out which types do, did you mean. And in this case, this is very easy to figure out because directly on the right hand side, you say, OK, it will be a person. So obviously, this will be a person. Um, but there are also, this is called local type inference, if you need some local information. But other languages like Haskell even have global type inference, where you're over the whole program, you don't, in theory, don't need to specify um, types. Um, and the compiler will figure out which types you mean. In general, specifying types is useful at the function level. 
so you know what is the data coming in. And this is also he helps if you make errors. The type errors will be a lot better if you have at least some type annotations. But there are even languages that infer subtypes. So for example, this is TypeScript code. And TypeScript has something that's called flow sensitive typing or data flow sensitive typing. So this argument is either a number or undefined as by our type annotation. And then if we check against this argument, this type is narrowed in the branches. So in this branch, this can't be undefined because we checked against it. So this type, this or type, this union type is narrowed down to just number. And in Yale's branch, it's narrowed down to just undefined. Idris can do something similar with uh, its proofs. You saw that uh, last week. In Haskell, you can also do this with um, GADTs. Um, but this doesn't have to matter, but it's just, you can even uh, um, check the types and based on that narrow or infer other types. No, you definitely don't have to uh, specify types. Misconception two, JavaScript, Python, or else do not have types. Um, this is also wrong. They have types, but they have only one type. So they are, that's called unityping. And um, you cannot define your own types. So there's basically, there, there is one type. And that's also why you don't need to annotate your types. So variables don't need annotation because there is only one type. So obviously your variable will be of that one type. How does this type look like? Something like this. Um, so in JavaScript, for example, types are either string, number, undefined, null, an object, or an array. If you say function, function is just a special object with a special key. Um, that contains basically the code to be executed. This is a simplification, but it works for now. Um, modern JavaScript added symbol, but then it's just another or in that, or another part in that union. So this is how the whole JavaScript type system looks like. So it's not that interesting, but it is a type system. And those languages that are unityped basically delay type checking to the runtime. So you just, pass around JS vals. And if you try to add string to a number, I'm not sure if thinking, depending on the order of those things, I think in Python, you get an error if you add a number to a string. In JavaScript, it will just coerce the number to a string and then add them anyways. But that's just how the, the language is implemented. But the, the runtime will do, will check, OK, the first argument, it, what is it? OK, it's a string. The second argument, OK, it's a number, what to do, and then based on what they are, for example, if you have two numbers, then add them. If you have a string and a number, concatenate them. So that's what the runtime does. But there's only one type that you pass around. And the last thing I often hear is typed languages deal poorly with untyped data, um, for example, JSON or something like that. But when I, like, if you go from there, like, you have JSON. Um, but this JSON doesn't come from anywhere. So assuming you have parsed that JSON from a string, um, that string also didn't come from anywhere. So maybe it came from a network as binary data. So again, you can assume that it's a valid UTF-8 string, but what if do you do if there's not an UTF-8 string? So usually this here, all that part to the left of JSON is handled by the language in the case of JavaScript, for example. And if there's an error, it will just throw an error. Um, so you're not assuming, blindly assuming that here. No, you are parsing already. Um, the node, for example, in the HTTP APIs will parse that binary data to a string, if you say it, it should. And if it won't parse, or if it's invalid, then it will throw an error. Same thing if you use json.parse. If json.parse from your string it does not work, it will throw an error. And this is the same thing if you use untyped or more typed languages. The same thing is if you, because this is actually the step that the, the, the programmer usually does. You have some JSON and you assume it's some JSON with a specific structure. So for example, you assume all the JSON has a key. Um, this is not inherently an, something that you can do with uh, typed with untyped language. Uh, well, you can do this with untyped languages, but you can also do it with languages like C. So you can just cast this JSON into uh, some other struct that has this key without any problems. And strong languages just force you to parse this, to verify that this, this is a structure, this JSON has the structure and fail otherwise. 
um, while C, for example, allows you to just cast willy-nilly, and then you get stuff like undefined behavior or array over out of bounds reads and all the other stuff. So this assuming is always a massive security risk. So you actually want to always parse your data and be sure to verify what you get. And this is no different in untyped versus typed languages, except that type languages makes this explicit. So from the network, for example, in Haskell, you would get a byte string and you parse it to a string or text and you parse it to JSON value. You can also go directly from the byte string to uh, this one for a performance reason. And then if you have a custom type with some specific structure or partly a specific structure, then again, you parse it into that type. But this is no different if you have a typed language or an untyped language. It just allows you to specify this. So to summarize all this, like types force you and allow you um, to make your assumptions explicit. And this is the important part. If you assume the data is completely random, you can say so. Like we have this byte string. This only says it's binary data. You don't know which binary data. This is not really useful to work with, but you can work with. For example, if you only want to shove the data somewhere else, you don't need to know what's in the data. But if you want to work with data, you need to have some assumptions and you need to verify those assumptions. And types force you to do make that verification, which is very good for security. Let's continue with the access, but this time with types. Types are great. So we can basically categorize types in two corners, static and dynamic. Static in this case means the compiler at compile time knows or determines, in the case of type inference, which type every variable has and uses that information for, for example, code generation. Or it doesn't have, for example, TypeScript just erases all the types, but it still knows all the types, small caveat. So on one on the static side, we have most of the compiled languages. Yeah, C, OCaml, Haskell, even though in Haskell, you don't have to specify types, same as in Elm because of type inference. At compile time, the compiler will know the types. So there's no type uh, checking at runtime. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, we have uh, JavaScript, Clojure, Python, Prolog, and Erlang, where all the type checking happens at uh, runtime. Because there's only one type, you never know exactly what you get. And in the middle ground, we have Java, TypeScript, and Go. Why? Because Java has everything is an object in Java, and you can cast willy-nilly between objects and non-objects, uh, uh, objects and other objects. With And you can may check in before with instance of. There is reflection where you do stuff at runtime that usually you do at compile time, code injection. So there's a bunch of lot of dynamic features going on in, in Java. Um, TypeScript I put there because of any. Um, TypeScript to interop with JavaScript needs some type that basically says, OK, this is some JavaScript value. I don't know which. Um, this is basically what any means. So any is like any value possibly explainable in JavaScript. And Go is really weak when it comes to its type system because it uh, uses a lot of duck typing. Its interface, you, you can extend, uh, you, you specify extends empty interface uh, to basically do anything. So many of the, of the inheritance features of Go rely on duck typing, which basically just trying to match the shape of another object, um, which is inherently unsafe if you don't really check against that. But the more interesting stuff is actually not to plot this in static versus dynamic, but to add another dimension, static, dynamic versus weak and strong. Because just because the compiler knows all the types doesn't mean the type system is particularly strong. And just because the compiler doesn't know the, well, Usually, because when a compiler, there is no compiler, then of course the type system can't be that strong. So all the dynamic languages, sadly, are in the lower left corner. In the lower, in the upper right corner, we have languages like Haskell and Idris, where Idris has dependent types and is statically typed. So it's a very strong expressive type system, um, and all the types are known at compile time. And Haskell doesn't have yet dependent types fully, but also very strong type system. Um, and on the other hand, C is a perfect example of a weak static type system. So C basically only has structs and primitive types and uses a lot of raw pointers and void pointers, and there's not many checks going on. So 
um, the C type system cannot express a lot of invariance here. Same with Go. Go is not really a strong type system because of all the duct typing. A bit stronger is Java. Um, it doesn't allow you duct typing. You have to define your interfaces, um, but you can still just cast around. Same with C++. Elm and OCaml, um, they are stronger, but they they don't have the expressiveness. You can't move, you can't express your problem that well in the type system to verify your implementation. TypeScript, interestingly, is, in my opinion, stronger than Elm or OCaml when it comes to a type system. And I will also, ex and I will, I'll explain this later, um, I think in two slides. Just keep that in mind for now. And Rust is pretty interesting with its um, lifetimes and with its traits. And so it, it's very expressive and new. And um, it's really cool to see even more type system features get adapted. So Rust basically took ideas from OCaml and from Haskell and tried to check, OK, which of one of those can do align with the goal of being a systems programming language with no garbage collection. So traits are basically a simplified version of Haskell type classes with less features. And many features come from OCaml. In fact, the original Rust compiler was written in OCaml. Um, so many ideas were borrowed there. And we can go even a bit further than uh, like, and in this, this, this division in strong and weak, actually there is more that you can actually see this on. So this is not just some vague notion I have. So, but for example, let's go for higher kind of types, um, also called generics, because we can divide those in three groups. Like the first group doesn't have generics. Um, so you have to cast around um, unsafely, even if in other languages you wouldn't have to. Um, then the majority of languages here have what I call level one generics. Um, so types can have a type argument, but not more. So they can take multiple arguments, but those arguments can take other arguments. So one example is generics in how they look in Java, TypeScript, or so um, with list of T, where T can be any type. So list of integer, list of string, whatever. And in the third group, we have full higher kind of types. So this means not only do types can take arguments, but those arguments can again take arguments, and that how how long we want to go there. So in a, in one of those languages, this, this would look like list of t of u. So this t is already like a generic, but then again, it is itself generic. So you could, for example, put uh, instead of t, you could put another list here. So you have list of list of int. Here you would have to specify list statically. So you could have list of list of t, but you couldn't replace that list then. Uh, in Haskell, it actually looks more like this. So you you get rid of those um, idiotic uh, angle brackets and just make use spaces. So f is already like an argument, and this argument takes another argument. So this is like one of the aspects where you can see like what sophi how sophisticated the type system is of a language. And another thing that's not really often talked about is how types influence values. And in the other direction, values influence types. So I saw there's a question just now. What do you think about uh, more language array or declarative? Yeah, so declarative languages often uh, like are often special purpose. For example, SQL is like the prime example of a declarative language, and it's very much specific to querying data. And it's really good for that. Um, the thing is with declarative languages, they allow the compiler to really optimize and to change around it. Because if you do not do not tell the compiler what to do, uh, how to do it, like in imperative languages, but only what to do, like query this from this table, then the compiler, or in this case, the database engine works as a compiler, can optimize and change around your the implementation without the result getting different, but having different performance characteristics. So for example, if the data database engine um, changes a full scan of the table with an index uh, join or something like that, um, the result is the same, but the performance characteristics are very different. And if you would have to implement this yourself, you would need a lot more info about the data and what is needed and so on. So it's better to leave this to the compiler. Haskell and Idris also fall in this category, like as pure functional languages, it is 
the, the compiler can change a lot more about the implementation. For example, in Haskell, you have list fusion. So if you use, if you map over a list and you map again over a list, this will actually be fused to a single iteration of the loop. In it versus in a imperative language, if you have two loops one after another, this will be two loops most likely. Probably LLVM can figure out that they will be the same and try. But it's very, it's a lot harder to do for uh, imperative languages to do that kind of fusion than uh, for functional or de or declarative languages. So declarative and functional, I would put like functional, I would put as a subset of declarative. But there are more declarative languages that are not really functionals. Turing completeness is often an accident and added with newer and more complex features. Array programming languages are also usually like a mix between declarative and imperative with special features towards arrays uh, and uh, data sets. So it, they, you declare basically, uh, Fortran also plays a little bit into that direction. So you have pure functions in Fortran and you can apply pure functions over all elements of an array um, with, uh, with ease. And that's also why Fortran is one of the languages that's so heavily used in um, scientific computation. So they, they are in, in that triangle I showed earlier. They are again somewhere between functional or declarative. I should have mentioned. I should have wrote written declarative there and imperative, depending on the specific implementation. I hope that at least my stance on that about this axis. So what does it mean for types to influence values? So some languages do not have any support for that. So go and see. At least I, I'm pretty sure about Go. I'm not totally sure about Go. Uh, same with Elm. Idris is the complete the opposite corner. So in Idris, you can use types can depend on values. That's what it makes a dependently typed language. But also values can depend on types. So uh, similar how Haskell type classes work. So Haskell is a bit lower in that regard because it's not fully dependent typed yet, at least. Um, but type classes are the prime example of types influencing values. But there's even a more general uh, example, and that is um, operator overloading or function overloading. So for example, it is normal in Java to have a function that is defined for int and for string. For example, logging. Log string, you don't need to uh, name that function log string, log int, log in. you can just name it log and then implement it once for int and once for string and once, and then that the compiler will choose which of the implementations to use based on the type of the thing you pass in. So the types influence which function is chosen at compile time. Um, that's also the reason why all the untyped languages or unityped languages really can't do this at all because there is no compiler to choose anything. And um, this also, Rust, I put a bit higher because Rust has some, you know, Rust is, should be in the same category, I'm sorry. TypeScript is a really interesting one because TypeScript, all the type information is erased. So the compiler, it doesn't matter if you write JavaScript or TypeScript, at the end, the code will look exactly the same. Versus for example, in Java, depending on the type of the thing you pass in, you can choose, but it's in the other axis. Values influence types because TypeScript has, um, literal types. So you can say, OK, this variable is the string hello, and this will be reflected on the type system. And then you can do computation with that. TypeScript recently added literal types, uh, not, not literal types, um, template types, which allow you to transform and match on those string types. So it's a very rich type language um, that is influenced by the values. So this, for me, is a really interesting candidate here because it the types do not help you for anything. You can't overload uh, based on types. You can't generate, like with type classes, you can basically generate code based on types. Nothing of that you can do in TypeScript, but you have very strong types and that are almost dependent, uh, almost dependently typed, which makes this a very interesting entrance here. And that's also more, uh, everything from my side. The hour is over. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm open for more questions now, otherwise later in the Slack. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jan. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. Jonas was asking about the object-oriented languages. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, object-oriented is, in my opinion, orthogonal. Um, so most object-oriented languages are imperative, um, like Java or C++ or whatever. but 
there is, for example, Scala, which is kind of a functional language that is object-oriented. So it doesn't really play into that paradigm uh, triangle. The thing about object-oriented, the core of object-oriented code is basically that you hide your data and your functions that operate on the data behind an abstraction. So you hide state behind an abstraction layer that is the class or the object. Yeah, and th this is not special, so you can implement this concept in any languages. But usually the state you hide is mutable, so that's why you usually do it in imperative languages, because their mutable state is normal. Great, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I'm looking, yeah. Um, languages, emoji-based languages, yeah, there are a lot of um, so-called esolangs, so languages that are not really useful, but more funny or show a specific, hey, this is possible. Because at the end, as I said, syntax doesn't matter. So whatever you use as syntax, you can use as a programming languages. One uh, one example is um, BrainFuck, which is like the granddaddy of them, which is eight symbols. And that's all the syntax you have. There's also white space, a language which consists entirely of a space, a tab, and a new line character. Those three characters is everything you need to program in a language. This means also that in an editor, all the code is basically not visible. But yeah, ESOLangs are usually um, not that interesting from a, a theoretical perspective because A, they are not really useful for general development and B, they are usually interpreted um, imperative. So there's not much to say there. Yeah, TypeScript is really fascinating because they could elect to do type driving emits, but in their explicit goal not to do that. Yeah, um, that's just simply one of the design decisions that they want to have TypeScript not change um, the behavior of runtime code based on types. I do not agree with that decision because it makes the type system less useful, but that's like trade-offs. It's, it's easier to, to convert JavaScript people to TypeScript if they know, hey, I want basically generate a bunch of code magically. And in general, yeah, languages mix and match their ideas. Um, there are smaller languages that I haven't talked about. And so everyone picks their favorite subset of the ideas and we, does the trade-offs they want. Awesome.